Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be my wrap-up for the first half of June of 2017. The first thing that I read this month was Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps by Kaya Shanti Wilson, which is a really interesting little fantasy novel. Both linguistically and stylistically, I thought this was spectacular. It does really interesting things with language and really interesting things with structure. There's a great deal of both code switching between different registers of English as well as other languages, as well as in terms of plot structure, where there is never a clear driving plot point. There are a number of flashbacks, but both the flashbacks and the present end up being slightly convoluted, some of which is maybe because the main character is in the current storyline not speaking his native language, and so some of that I think is a representation of that challenge of speaking a language in which you're not completely fluent. When I started reading it, my initial thought was that the the main language registers were a kind of pseudoscientific option, a curated received pronunciation option, and a, an American Southern English option, and when I finished about half of the book, I went and looked on the author's website, and his comment was that what he was actually doing was trying to represent a Regency-style literary English, African-American vernacular English, and the English of a physics professor, in addition to some Spanish and French bits from other characters, which just made for a really interesting writing style. So I was super impressed with that. And to tie into that, I think this succeeds at three things that a lot of people who like fantasy but are disappointed with a lot of the fantasy, or at least the mainstream fantasy that's out there, I think it succeeds on three different points. I think one of the major complaints is that a lot of fantasy writers really need an editor these days. There are obviously still some fantasy writers who write shorter form works, but it's very popular these days to see these, you know, 800,000 page books. And there are some writers who can write a spectacular 800 page book, but with a lot of them who just really need an editor. So seeing something like this that pulls off epic fantasy in just over 200 pages was great to see. So I loved that. One of the second complaints that a lot of people have about fantasy is that it tends to be very linear and plot driven. And if you both like fantasy environments and more challenging writing styles, there's not a lot for you necessarily. But this definitely, as I said, does really interesting things with language and with style. So I thought that was magnificent. And thirdly, I've seen a lot of discussions lately about diversity in fantasy that tends to focus more on the young adult angle, and this is definitely not a young adult book. This is aimed at grown people. And that argument is usually that 90% of fantasy is set in a kind of pseudo-England, and the 10% is like a pseudo-Japan, and it tends to be a, a young, sort of white European-style heterosexual boy who goes forth on a quest and probably has a romance with a girl who might turn out to be a princess or something along the way. That's kind of the standard. Whereas this is set in an environment that has bits that are, some of it's reminiscent of Morocco, some of it's reminiscent of Louisiana, and the main characters are, are portrayed as being either black or North African. The two main characters are adult men who are in a relationship with each other, so there's none of this coming-of-age quest story. Not only not a heterosexual romance, it's not really a romance at all because they're in this pre-existing relation. So I think if, if that's a complaint that you have in fantasy, and again I realize a lot of those discussions are coming from people who read young adult fantasy as opposed to not that, but this does check a lot of those boxes if people are interested in that. Number one reason to read this book is because the language and the use of language is just brilliant. Really, I was extremely impressed with this. It was such an interesting read. It was written to be more challenging, and I loved that. I wish we'd see more of that in fantasy. So because I had just finished that, I was in the mood to read something that was maybe dealing more with dialect again. So I picked up Jamie O'Neill's At Swim Two Boys, which my sister gave me, I think 10 or 12 years ago, and I had read the first few pages and I'd heard it described as Joycean, and uh, I'm always cynical about that because I think everybody describes every Irish literary writer as being Joycean. But the first few pages did, were very dialect heavy and very almost stream of consciousness. So at the time I wasn't in the mood for that, so I put it aside and kind of forgot that I had this. 
and uh, I saw this on my shelf as I was packing up and realized that, you know, maybe it was time to read this. And I quickly discovered that first chapter is the only part of this that's written in that style. So it flows much more naturally later on. It goes a lot faster. So I thought that was a little funny. I have since read that in some of the US editions of this book, they actually leave out the first chapter, which I guess makes the whole more accessible because it definitely was one of those chapters where I went, oh, it's one of these books. In any case, uh, this tells the story of people from three different families in 1915 and 1916, just outside of Dublin. The, the two boys of the title are Jim and Doyler, who are the sons of two men who had been friends during their military time. Their fathers were both men who had been in poverty in Ireland and had joined the British military and been involved in colonial campaigns in India and South Africa. And coming back to Ireland, Jim's father had become an entrepreneur. He started a business. He's trying to get his family, not just through the working class, but maybe into the middle class. And Jim is at kind of a posh school where he's got a scholarship. Whereas Doyler's father sunk back into poverty and alcoholism, and he's working a very drudgery kind of job. And they're both 16 at this point. And they are in a band, which is also organized by a man in his, who is probably in his late 20s, who is from a fairly well-to-do family and has recently come back to Ireland after having lived in England and having served two years of hard labor for being caught with his chauffeur lover and because he's just had that experience. So the at swim part is a reference to the fact that in 1915 the boys decide that on Easter of 1916 they're going to improve their swimming to a level that they can each swim out to a particular rock and the older character is going to be training one of them in the swimming. Reading it, of course, you know Easter 1916 is when there's going to be the Easter Rising. So you're, you're sort of waiting for that political element to kick in. And there is quite a bit of that. So it's very much wedded to that time. You're watching the blooming independence struggle. But you also have the First World War is going on. So, for example, Jim's brother is in the military and he was at Gallipoli. It, it's very much tied to the time and to progress. You look at it knowing both the social conventions of the era and the history that is happening. It's hard not to go into this expecting a tragedy. And as a plot, it does move in tragic ways. But what fascinated me was that it's incredibly optimistic that even when there are definitely tragic plot points, it still feels very optimistic. So you have this sense that, you know, people's lives are going to be hard, but things are changing. And in some of them, they're really right on the precipice of change. Like, Ireland is going to become independent. So yeah, it, it's the change of both the colonial era and the more distant change that is coming in terms of legal homophobia, basically. So yeah, it, it, it fascinated me to read something that is clearly dealing with massively depressing topics that is simultaneously so incredibly optimistic. So yeah, this was really impressive. I really enjoyed this. So after that, I thought I would read, pick up a quick bit of nonfiction. And I read Neil deGrasse Tyson's Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. One of my neighbors, who's a middle school science teacher, was raving about this. So I, I picked it up with high expectations because of what he said. I, I would say that it perhaps, I think he built it up a little <laughs> too much. It is just over 200 pages, so it's definitely a book that people in a hurry can read. It is a nice overview of what astrophysics is. There's a chapter in here that talks about elements on Earth and goes through them from, you know, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, and so forth. And I loved that. I thought that was a lot of fun. I feel like if you were looking for an astrophysics for dummies, it's not quite that. But if you have even, say, the equivalent of a first year university course in astronomy or, or even chemistry or geology or something, I, I think it's maybe too basic. So I'm not 100% sure of who the target market is because well, I, I, actually, no. Now, as I say that, I realize it's probably for people who watch uh, science documentaries. I think that's the maybe ideal audience for this. So it wasn't quite what I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be a little meatier, 
but as a as an overview, I thought it was fun. But yeah, I really loved the elements chapter. I thought that was really nicely done. And stylistically, it's great. It's very accessibly written. So after that, I read Wolf Moon, which is a collection of uh, Cullen Bunn and Jeremy Hahn's uh, Vertigo miniseries about a guy who's investigating werewolves, more or less. It's a fairly standard werewolf story. It has both a werewolf story and a murder mystery that is related to the werewolf story running concurrently, which is interesting enough. It doesn't really do anything new. The murder mystery is a standard murder mystery, and the werewolf story has a slight twist on the, the werewolf myth and that the werewolfism, lycanthropy, isn't transmitted through bites. It's just randomly transmitted through the air. So that's a bit of an interesting turn, but, but overall it wasn't particularly spectacular. I quite liked the art style. Um, I thought that was probably the best part of it. Story-wise, it was okay. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. It was fine. Then finally, I picked up Batwoman Volume 6, The Unknowns, which is the final volume of the run of Batwoman that started with the New 52. I had liked the earlier part of the series. This book, however, is not good at all. The art is decent, but not spectacular. The story is not interesting at all. It is a crossover with some B-level magical characters. I say this all the time, but I'm not a huge fan of crossover events, or I'm not any kind of fan of crossover events in superhero books. So that on its own was disappointing. As an end to the series, it's a little ridiculous. It's Batwoman has broken up with her long-standing girlfriend, the cop, and is dating a werewolf. Not a werewolf got werewolves on the mind, is dating a vampire and it goes poorly, obviously. It, this is dumb. <laughs> it's just not good. I, I don't even have anything else to say about this. It was just uninspiring and eh, not very good. So anyway, that was the first half of the month for me. I am packing up because obviously we're moving shortly. I did take some videos of uh, the packing we've done of books, obviously not this shelf yet, but in my husband has kept saying, you realize you have too many books, right? Which is not as bad as some of the other things that he's saying when he looks at the action figures. He's like, are you aware that you're a middle-aged woman and not a teenage boy? But hey. In any case, I might post some of those boxing up videos. I'm not sure. That might be too boring to post, but uh, we'll see. In any case, I hope your June is going well. I know some people are on holidays now already, so I hope you're having a good one if you are. And, uh, you know, if not, I still hope you're having a good week. <laughs> anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.